Caution, approaching school zone. Lad's not coming to the Hello, good morning, those who are watching on Zoom. And we have plenty of people in person. I'm going to switch the camera around. <laughs> Just waiting, we had a slight um, source sheet, a printing error. So we're going to sort that out and then we'll be on our way. Rabbi Bill, how many people do you have there in the Midrasha? How many people are we in person? We're ten, we're ten, we're ten, we're ten ladies and myself. Oh, love. Love. Oh, okay, and okay. My wife Shira is joining us today. Oh, beautiful. Right. So she can oh. give me marks out of ten as well, not just to leave. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't be with you. You've got some love. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to Hannah, Hannah Bell. Who made that that? Yeah. Hi. Oh. So we'll start in one moment. Sorry. Yeah, the only one. She, yes. Okay. So we're going to start. No. Oh, here we go. Okay. This is my Shira. Okay. Okay. And you say hi. You can say hi to everyone on the screen. Hi. Okay. So here, let's give you uh, a little bit. Okay, now that we've got the source sheets going around, we'll, we'll start. Apologies for the delay. So even modern printing has its uh, limitations. So uh, good morning to everyone on Zoom, good morning to everyone here. Um, we find ourselves in Parashat Vayeshev. We're moving on and the focus is changing away from, uh, from Yaakov Avinu. Um, obviously to his children, right? As we know, and, and, and this goes on. And, and this is indicative in the fact that the, the Torah talks already about the Toldot Yaakov, the generations or the trials and tribulations or the, 
the acts of uh, Yaakov, uh, which we see in the opening Psukim. Right, the, the Torah starts in the first source, by Yeshiv Yaakov Beretz and Gray Aviv Beretz, Canaan, that Yaakov dwelled in the land of the sojournings of his forefathers in the land of Canaan. Ele Toldot Yaakov, these are the Toldot, which we usually translate as generations or descendants of Yaakov. And then what does it do? It straightaway jumps to Yosef, because Yosef, Yosef is, is the generations of Yaakov, um, which usually is, is, is a hint about the fact that the story is now moving somewhat away from Yaakov to talk about everything that he has. Again, um, reflecting the idea that really a person's uh, mark on this world is what they leave behind with their children. So Toldot Yaakov, the generations of Yaakov, and, and everything that he matters is Yosef and, and his children, everything that goes on. And that's uh, that sort of focus shifting from Yaakov to Yosef. So let's just read these opening for Kim here because they're very important to understanding the first Rambam we're going to look at. So we said in Pasuk Bet, Ele Toldot Yaakov, these are the uh, descendants or generations of Yaakov. We're Yosef, Yosef I'm just going to mute, but feel free to unmute. It's, it's only... okay. going to do mute all, but please feel free to unmute if you have any questions. And as I said last week, I can't do that in the room anymore. One of the disadvantages of in-person learning. But um, we, sorry, I lost the screen share. Let me just reshare that. Okay. So Yosef ben Shva Esrei Shana, so Yosef is 17 years old. Haya Ro'et Echav Batson, he was a shepherd with his brothers of the flock. Vuhu Na'ar, the Torah repeats. And he was a Na'ar, he was a young man, a lad. At Bnei Zilpa, Bilha, at Bnei Zilpa, and Shea Abiv, with the sons of Bilha and Zilpa, his, his highest father's wives. Vayave Yosefit Dibatam Ra'al Abihem. And Yosef brings a bad report about them, not clear about who precisely. To their father. We'll talk about that in a second. So we have these details that he's a shepherd with, with the with the maid servant sons, right? Dan Naftali, Gad and Asher, and Yosef brings a bad report about them to his father. The Yisrael Ahav et Yosef Mikol Banav. And that's why it tells us that Yisrael Yaakov loved Yosef more than all his other sons. Ki ben skunim hulo, because he is a ben skunim. It's not clear what that phrase means. Um. It literally means son of his old age is how it's typically translated. Benyamin. Right, Benjamin also. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Remind me your name though. Vera. Vera. Okay, Vera. Okay. Vera is asking, Givens Kunim Hulo, well, surely he had a, a, another son after him when he was even older. So that's something we're also going to address. The Asalok Tonic Passive, he made this coat of stripes of many colors. And his brothers saw. His brothers saw that he loved, that their father loved him. Mikol echav out of all his brothers, for yisnu oto v'lo yachu dabro l'shalom. And they hated him, and they could not speak well to him. L'daber l'shalom means to speak in a peaceful manner, or speak well of him, or speak well to him. So we have this background. There's, there's a lot of details here which sort of need to be explained precisely about what was the trigger here for the brothers hating him, because on the one hand, you have the fact that he brought a bad report to them, but then on the other hand, it says that the brothers... Uh, resented him because they thought that the father, Yaakov, preferred him over them. So the question is, what was the, what was the trigger here, everything that goes on? So let's have a look at Ramban, who first he brings the interpretation of Rashi, uh, which is the first few lines in this first Ramban. And then uh, he goes on to, to, to disagree and bring his own explanation. So let's first read Ramban of citing Rashi. Shahaya osem arut. Because the Pasuk says he was a lad with the children, with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. What does that mean? He was a lad with the, right? Et can also mean with. So what does it mean he was a lad with them? So Rashi understands that means he was a na'ar, he was a lad. He was acting in a, a childish or youthful manner. Like do up his eyes and play with his hair. Um, teenager, right? Looking in the mirror. Right, at Bnei Vilha with the children of Bilha, Klomar, that doesn't mean he was with the children of Bilha, according to Rashi. This means Klomar Uragil et Bnei Vilha. He was usually, regularly, like Ragil, regular, right, was regularly with Bnei Vilha, with Bilha and Zilpah's children. Because his other brothers would scorn them, because they are the children of the maidservant rather than the children of the primary wife. Behuma Karvan, and he'd bring those. This is how Rashi understands that he was close to them because presumably the Bene Lea, Lea's children, looked down upon them because they were only the brother, the, the children from the maid servant rather than one of the, the, the main wives. Also, they were probably closer to his age. 
where they were closer to his age. What's interesting, I mean, Yisa, right, so Yisachar and Zvulun would have been closer to his age, Leah's youngest children, because she had them afterwards. Yeah. But uh, so it's interesting that but still, specifically, he, according to Rashi, he, he was with them because he was a little bit of an outsider. Also, he was lost his mother as well. So he was he had, had no mother. So, so that's another explanation which is given. But he naturally was close to them because they also felt a bit like outsiders. Buhuma Karvan, says Rashi, he would, he would bring them close. But still, the Batam Ra'ah, he reported badly about them. Kol Ra'ah Shahaya Ra'ah Le'ah. So this is important. Rashi says that that phrase that Yosef would report badly about them is referring to the B'nai Le'ah, Leah's children, not, not Bilhah's children, but Leah's children. Kol ra'ash haya ru'ebe echav b'nei le'ah, whenever he would see any bad behavior by his brothers from le'ah, haya magid la'aviv, he would tell his father. Lashon Rashi, until that's, that's Rashi's words. In other words, Rashi paints this picture whereby uh, Yosef hangs out with b'nei bilhah, b'nei zilpa, with the maidservants, kids, because they also felt a little bit like outsiders, and he would report to his father about the children, Ruben, Shimon, Levi, Hudei, Sachas, Bulan, from uh, Leah, who would basically be mean to his other brothers. And that's how Rashi paints the picture. Um, Ramban disagrees with this, as we're going to see now. In the third line, the Imken. If this is the case, says Ramban, if this is the picture that the whole strife was with Leah's children, then why didn't the maidservant's children uh, save him? Why were they involved in the sale? Right, so again, it's Ramban looking at the bigger picture here um, and the finer details. Who or Hevotan, if surely he loves them, according to Yurashi, from a caravan and would bring them close. And would tell on his other brothers for making fun of them. And if we're going to say that the reason they didn't act, really they did love him, but the, the May 7th children did love him, but they didn't act because because they were scared of their other brothers. Surely there are four of them, right? There's Dan, Naftali, and Gad and Asher, but Ruven and Kemal, we know Ruven also didn't really want to sell or kill Yosef, but Yosef at Simon, Yosef himself, so the Tigbar Yadam Alehem, it's already six, it's already six on six at that point. So it's not, it can't be because they were scared that they would interact, that they didn't act. But Afki Lo Yovai Mahem Bamulchama, they could beat them even without it turning into a full-blown uh, battle, still they could have intervened. There were enough of them. And furthermore, because if you look again at the, the, the actual words in Psukim, so it seems that all the brothers, apart from Ruven, obviously, were content with selling Yosef. So it's not that there's this, you know, the, the maid servants, children, and Yosef and versus the others, but rather they they all were content and agreed to the selling of Yosef. But he says that according to, to Chazal in the Midrash, that Yosef was telling to Yaakov about all of them, Al-Kulam, all the brothers. Um, so we have Rashi, who says it specifically about the B'nai Le'ah, Le'ah's sons, uh, that he was telling. Ramban says he doesn't think that makes so much sense in the Pshat, the simple understanding, because then they would have intervened. And there were enough of them that would have, they could have stood up for him if they'd wanted. And furthermore, that the Psukim seem to say that they were content with it. There's no, just, there's nothing in the Psukim which seems to imply that they weren't happy about it, or they just went along with it because they were scared. And also the Midrash seems to say that Yosef spoke against all his brothers to his father, not just Leah's children. Right, there's no word in the Pasuk either, right, to say that it was only Leah's, Leah's children. It just says, so where does Rashi get to that conclusion though? Because Rashi is building on the first half of the Pasuk. Because the first half says he was with the B'nai Bilhah, B'nai Zilpah. So Rashi says, why was he with B'nai Zilpah and Bilhah and Zilpah's right. children? So it must be, and therefore, if he loved them, therefore, when he's talking, it must be the other people. So Rashi's building on the first half of the Pasuk. Right. Although, although it doesn't say that, so Rashi putting his own uh, explanation into the, yeah. into the Pasukim. So let's go to the next one. The next, that small paragraph. Hanachon Be'inai, the correct... Uh, Understanding in my eyes, says Ramban, that this pasuk where it says he's a na'ar with Bilha and Zilpa, shab leva'er mashu his kir. It's not coming to teach us some new idea that he was specifically with them, but it's returning to to clarify and expand upon that which it already mentioned. Vishiro, and its meaning is Yosef, Yosef, v'hu na'ar ben Shvaisra. He is a lad who was only seventeen. Ben Shvaisra shana hayavro et b'tzom. It's a chav. He was. Simply a shepherd with at Bnei Bilhah, the Bnei Zman Aviv. He was simply a shepherd with Bilhah and Zilpah, the uh, sons, the, the wives of his father. 
So it's not coming to teach us like Rashi that it's something new. It's just simply that that's what his job was. Or alternatively, or it could be that this pasuk v'hu moshech acher imo. So here, Rambam thinks something interesting. The word v'hu is moshech. It's dragging acher another thing with it. If you go back to the top of the page, the psukim. So the beginning of that, um, in the beginning of the pasuk v'hu naar. So it and he was a young man. Et b'nei heart means he was a young man, the who, and the, the who is also going on, and in addition, he was also with b'nei Vilha. So he was a lad, and also he was with b'nei Vilha and Blaise Silpa. Not that, they, that, that, that he was a na'ar with them, or that he was fighting with them, or that he was deliberately, um, deliberately was joining them because the, the lair was, children were being mean, but simply he was a young man, and he was b'nei Vilha and b'nei Silpa. He was with their children as well. Um, what's the purpose of that? We go back to, to, to Rampan there. Umishpato, this means Vahu Naar, he was a young man. Vahu et benebil havnesil panashel. This is just a technical grammatical point. And he was also hanging out with them. Yomar to, to say, Kihunar, he was a young man. Vahu en benebil havnesil panashel. Tamid, he was always with them. Loi pared mehem ba avul naruto. He would not uh, leave their side due to his young age. Because again, he didn't have a mother and he hung out with them. This is Ramban's understanding now. Why is he hanging out with them? He was a lad and he was with them. Because their father commanded them. That they should look after him and, 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 look out and serve him and, and watch him. Not the sons of the, the, um, the, main, the main wives, meaning Leah. And obviously, Rachel Binyamin was young. So, so first thing first, so we get to the next bit. Ramban is saying here, simply the reason he's hanging out with Zilha and Zilpah is because that's perhaps what Yaakov instructed. But Yaakov instructed that they should uh, look after him. And he didn't uh, put that um, task on the elder brothers who were from Leah, who's the primary wife, but rather on one of the um, maidservants, uh, on the maidservants' children instead. But what happens, says Ramban, v'hu mevi mehem dibar ra'a el abihem. And he would bring a bad report about them to their father. Not about Leah's children, like Rashi said, but about them, Bilha and Zilpah's children. Dan, Naftali, Gad, and Asher, who he, are looking after him and, 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 and they're with him. He's hanging out with them all the time and they're sort of nurturing him and looking after him. He has no, no mother. Um, they're the ones, and they're looking out for him. They're the ones who he reports to his father. So oh. says Ramban, and that's why. And therefore, these four brothers hated them, resented him. That's, that's Rashi's, uh, Ramban's next words. Then specifically, these four brothers uh, hated him. They, they disliked him because they're, they're, they're upon his request. They are looking after him upon Yaakov's request. And he, in this, as they see, is throwing it back in their face. So if you go back to the Pasuk, this also might fit in a little bit more. If we go back to the original verse, because it's that it builds on the fact that the, the verse is said in Pasuk Bet, he's with B'nai Vilha and B'nai Zulpah, his, 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 his father's wives. And he brought back a report, a bad report about them. Dibatam, them. So it says them. Rashi, so Ramban says, who's them? That the people has just mentioned, those four brothers. It's not the other six. Grammatically, it fits in better, and that's what Ramban points out. It doesn't cover Yosef in glory, that's for sure. I think that was part of the emphasis, the fact that he's, not, that he's a young kid, he's a teenager, he's a 17-year-old, he's got a lot of angst, and he doesn't seem to, but that's clearly, a, a, and Yosef goes through a whole journey over the next two parishes, and we'll sort of discuss that as, as we go along, but it's clear that uh, at this point, he's, 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 he's a teenager, and he still has very much to learn. Um, so Ramban is fascinating. He turns everything that Rashi said on its head. Rashi had said, no, he's with the four brothers from the maid servants, and he's reporting against Leia's children. Ramban says, no, no, he's reporting against the four brothers who were the ones looking after him. And that's what that caused a little bit. Like, again, it's that psychology of Ramban trying to say, well, look at the Psukim and see what makes sense. Now you understand why they're angry. They're the ones who looked after him. Still, he, he turned it around and, and reported them. Right? They're the ones who caring for him and this is how he repays them so to speak um okay, all here again okay so there we go okay um okay so what goes on so that's part one the four brothers what about all the rest of the brothers how did they get angry with him? so ramban continues there the end of the third line in that last paragraph there but afterwards 
So that was part one. The four brothers didn't like him because they didn't feel that they were treated or in a very respectful manner after them looking after him. They were watching out for him and he just reported them to the father. But afterwards, Amar the Torah tells us, Ki Aviv Ahivo, that his father Yaakov loved him. Vayiru Echav Achimim, and then his other brothers saw, Ki Oto Ahav Avihem Yoter Mikulam, that uh, their father loved him more than all of them. Vayikan Ubo Vayisnu, and they were jealous of him and hated him, resented him. So we have a second factor here, says Ramba. The, the Dan, Naftali, Gad, Asher, the Wilhelm Silver's children didn't like him because they thought they were being repaid poorly for watching out for him. What about the other brothers? They don't hate him because anything that Yosef did to them, but simply because they're jealous of the fact that Yaakov seemingly loved him more than them. They're not mad because they're, they're not upset with Yaakov. Right, they, but the, that not that always the way? That we don't get angry at our parents, you know, that he, he does think my brother, we get angry with the sibling instead? We don't get angry with the parents, we take it out on the sibling. It's your fault that he loves you more, right? Nimtza, as a result, says Ramban, these powerful words, Sanu mikulam, he's hated by all of them. The, the, the children from the, the, the primary wise hate him. Uh, um, what, they're jealous of him. Lama yehavo tomehem, why does dad love you more uh, than us? We're also from the primary wives, from Leah and Rachel. And the maidservants' children don't like. They're not, they don't resent him for this. They hate him. And they don't like him because he's reporting about them and telling tales on him to their father. So everyone uh, is angry with him at the end, but for different reasons. So, so Ramban here has painted this picture where it's not just, you know, us and them because that doesn't seem to fit with the Psukim, says, says Ramban. That's what Rashi had said. Ramban says, if you look at the Psukim, you have to take it and analyze it. Pasuk, pasuk, pasuk. One tells us that he reported it badly. That's going on the brothers who it just mentioned. The other brothers, it only comes later, because that's why the Torah has to tell us that the next Pasuk, the Yisrael Ahav Yosef the Kolbanav. Yisrael loved Yosef more than all his other children. And then that's why they hate him because that's Pasuk Dalud. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the others. And they hated him because of that. So Ramban does a great analysis here where he splits the two. Pasuk Bet's talking about those other brothers. Pasuk Dalud is talking about the rest. So as a result, unfortunately, there is a common denominator here, which is that all the brothers eventually end up hating and resenting Yosef. It's fascinating. It's not mentioned here. I mean, we know Binyamin must have been a few years younger. So he was probably around 12 or 11, according to Chazal, at least at this point. So because he was probably around six years, at least six years younger, because we know that ya he was born on the way back. And Yaakov was born, Yosef was born after 14 years, and then they were another six years. So he was at least, so he was at least 11, if not 10. So it's not clear exactly what his role here is in the story. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. As to what Yosef thought, but, but Binyamin, Binyamin is significantly younger than the others because the other brothers were all born from four wives in the space of seven years. Because we know that after the seven, he waited seven years for, to marry uh, Rachel, then ended up marrying Leah, then a week later married Rachel, continued for seven years. And then after the seven years, Yosef's born and Yaakov says, I want to go. And then Lavan encourages him to stay for another six years. And then he ends up being 20 years in Haran. <laughs> Sorry, well, Binyamin. It's possible that Binyamin was home. It, it wasn't actually at the sale. That's certainly possible. But we know if, if this happened when you, if he was seventeen, so Binyamin was up the very oldest, eleven, even according to the Pshat, youngest, or possibly nine, depending. Chazal say they were on the way for two years. Depends how you do the maths. But uh, yeah, so clearly Binyamin is a minor character in this this part of the story. So what about Yaakov and Yosef? So you have to remind me your name again. Michelle. Michelle. Zalman's, Zalman's mom. mom. Zalman's mom. Okay, Michelle. Yeah. So um, uh, the question is, what, why is it that Yaakov liked him? And, and as Michelle pointed out, he's a Ben's Kunim, um, but there are other brothers. It was, maybe it wasn't Michelle. It was Vera. I'm sorry, Vera. Vera mentioned that it was, he also had a, a son later, right? As I said, at least six years later, Binyamin. So why is, why is Yosef the Ben's Kunim? The, uh, the son of the old age. So again, uh, here in the next section, what I call Yaakov and Yosef, um, he commences by quoting Rashi, 
and then tries to bring his own uh, explanation as to exactly what this relationship is between Yaakov and Yosef, that he was the favorite one. But the Torah tells us just objectively, the Yaakov Ahavet Yosef, that Yaakov loves him more than the others. So the next section then, page one, Kivens Kunim Hulo, because he was a son of his old age, she, says Rashi, Ramban quoting Rashi, Shenolad Lo Be'et Ziknatel, because he was born to him at his, at his old age. That's Rashi. The Unclus Tirgen, whereas Targ of Unclus translates it in Aramaic to Are Bar Chakim Hule, not, but understanding Kunim, not as Zikna old age, but as in like a Zakain, like an elderly or a wise person, Chakim, like Chacham. So Are Bar Chakim Hule, he was a Bar Chacham, a wise son to him. And because Zaken can mean elderly or in terms of age, but it can also mean wisdom. So Unclus understands Shakol Mashelamad Mishem Be'ever, everything that points to the Midrash, Yaakov learned in the Yeshiva of Shem and Ever, Masarlo, he passed on to him. In other words, he was his prodigy that he passed everything, prodigy that he passed everything on to. That's what Rashi says. Either it was old age, he quotes Unclus, who says it was the son that he chose to be his continue, basically his continuation, and he passed everything on to. Dava Acher, alternatively, says Rashi Shahayaziv Ikonim Shelo Domelo. It means not zikunim, but like based on zi, it's, it's um, a contraction of the Arab, like in Aramaic, ziv ikunim. It means he was not zikunim, he was a son of his old age, but he was a ben z, ziv ikunim. He was a son who was the image of his father. In other words, he looked just like his father. Zikunim is supposed to be like ziv ikunim. Whether that's shat or not is a different question, but the idea is that Rashi is bringing an explanation to say that Yosef was the image of his father. He was the one with the brains. He was the one that Yaakov saw as a natural continuation for him to pass all his knowledge and continue his legacy. Lashon Rashi, that, that's what Rashi says until this point. The Chenam Rabbi Abraham, and so does Rabbi Abraham. Rabbi Abraham being Ibn Ezra, also says, he bens kunim shahilidu kunab, that he, he, he fathered him in his old age, who ben tishim vachat shana, and he was around 91. The gam echav bin yamin karul yelis kun kata. And also, um, so this goes back to Vera's question that also his brother Binyamin was called Yeled Zukunim Katam, would have been a younger child. But Yosef is the older Yeled Zukunim, if you like. I says Ramban in the next paragraph, I don't agree. I don't agree to this. Because the Torah tells us, Because the Torah tells us the reason that Yaakov loved Yosef more than the other sons is because he's a Ben Zkunim, because he's the son of his Zkunim, his old age, whatever that means. Surely, what, what did I just say? That they were all born in the space of about seven years. So all of them were born in his elder, old age. And Leah's youngest sons, Yisachar and Zvulun, are, are, are not much older than Yosef, at, at most a year or two, respectively older than him. So it doesn't make sense to, to pinpoint Yosef as the Ben Zkunim in the sense that Rashi does, son of old age. That, that's Ramban's claim. So he's you're saying that. So what's your name? Sorry, my sorry, Mina. So Mina's asking. I'll repeat it so that everyone knows on Zoom. Last question. So <laughs> Mina's asking that. Um, well, he was the youngest in that sort of slot, and then there was a big gap, and then there was Binyam. So it could be. That's what I. That's what I personally think. Rashi is hinting it to. Um, again, because. Even though Binyamin is younger, Binyamin is still in some sense a child. Uh, so it, it, he hasn't really seen him develop into, into a, a young man, like the way that Yaakov seen Yosef develop into as a 17 year old where he start to have, you know, have real nachas, right? Um, and, and start to, to let, you know, show him the way and see how he, he becomes his continuation. So it's certainly possible that, um, it's certainly possible that that's what Rashi was hinting at. Why would they not have seen it as a reason? As, as a thing because of his Rachel's son, and that Rachel was the father of life. Susan, right? Okay. Right. So, so, so Susan is arguing why is it that they didn't just simply say explain this because he was Yosef's son? Well, I think the pro Rachel's son. Sorry, but Yosef was Rachel's son. So we always assume that. What's the what's the pro what's the problem with it? If you look in the pasuk at the beginning of the page. 
it says explicitly otherwise mm -hmm. in Pasuk Gimel. The Yisrael Ahava Yosef Mikol Banav. The Yisrael loved him. Kiven Skunim Hulo because he was a son of his Skunim, his elderly age, whatever that means. It doesn't say because he was Rachel's son. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to think part of the reason the brothers, by the way, the brothers don't understand this. And if you look in Dai, it wasn't. It's not because he was the baby that they loved him. They possibly did think, like you said. Because if you look in the next pass of Dalad, it says, They just saw that he preferred him. And they hated him for it. So if it's possible that they thought it's because he's Rachel's, um, Rachel's son, that's why. But they don't understand why it really was. Which is still not clear to us, which is perhaps what Ramban is going to explain to us now a little bit. So he doesn't like Rashi's opinion about the age thing, because he said there wasn't that much uh, age, even though Minna and others have pointed out that that, that really does depend how you understand. So what does he say? So this is the second last paragraph, page one. And it seems in my eyes, says Ramban, and this is again Ramban trying to give some sort of historical context um, to explain the, the, the Pesukim. It seems in my eyes, that the minhag, the practice, the custom of the elderly people was of the elders would they would take one of their children, Hakatani, one of the youngest children, Liot to take him as a helper. Right? And he would literally lean on him always, constantly, and not part from him. And that child would be called the Ben Skunim the child of our old age. In other words, the child who's also a carer. Because he serves him and tends to him in his old age. That's what Ramban says Ben Skunim means. It's not because he was objectively in terms of age, he the, the a son of Yaakov's old age, but he was the carer. He stayed at home. He looked after him. He's the one who brought him his meals and everything while everyone else went out to work. And Yaakov specifically took Yosef for this purpose, Bahaya Imotamid, and he was with him constantly. But Al Ken, and therefore, Lo Yelechim Hatson. That's why Yosef didn't go out with, with the flock, Birotambim Komrachok, when they went to, to the shepherd far away. That's why he didn't go with, and that's how he ended up getting lost, and because he didn't go with, he stayed at home to look after his father. In other words, says Ramban, Ben's Kunim is a role, and it's a specific role, a cultural role, but, but, but a role. That, you know, he is the younger son and Binyamin was still too young to do it. And he picked Yosef to do it because he was the energetic young son, the athletic one who was able to look after him at home. And the others were out to work. And he stayed at home. And that is what engendered this love between the two of them, not just by his objective age. Yes, Naomi. Yeah, but it's interesting that um, they say that he was a shepherd, even though he's a real professional to do that. People look after their parents. They quit their jobs for it. You have to balance it, right? But uh, it's clear that he was doing it partially, but he was still going home. I also thought about this, right? Literally, the first uh, words to describe yourself is he's 17. He was, he, would, he was a shepherd with his brothers. But we... Sorry, Shira? What might it mean? He was looking after his brothers instead of the flock. But it says Ro'eh to Chavbat Son is the only thing. So I don't know. Because it says an interesting point, maybe if you start looking at overseeing his brothers, he was shepherding them, trying to micromanage them uh, out of... Uh, but the problem is it also says Bat Son. So, but it, it, you, could, you could say, I suppose, what Shira is suggesting, that it, it, it's certainly hinting to the fact that he was trying to be like holier than thou and reporting them and everything, because he was shepherding them with the flock. But the question is, is he shepherding the flock or is he shepherding them with the flock? Um, depends how you put the emphasis on it. It's an interesting explanation. Um, thank you, Susie. That's my wife, by the way, just in case I didn't know who I was calling Sweetie. Okay. It starts off with referring to Yaakov as Yaakov, by Yeshiv Yaakov, and then it goes to Yisrael Ahav. Do you know? Yeah. 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 Well, why, why Yaakov to Yisrael? So for those of you who were in the main meeting of Beit Yehuda on Shabbos, I spoke about Yaakov versus Yisrael, um, but I didn't really touch upon this, but... Um, it seems that Yisrael is the name of destiny, if you like, and that when, when Yaakov comes to stand up for himself, again, there's different ways to understand it, but, but when we talk about B'nai Yisrael, we're talking about the long-term picture. So it could be the specifically here that Yisrael loved Yosef um, because Yaakov is looking at his position, you know, the Dorot, for the, you know, for the Hemshech, for the continuation. How is it that I look going forward? So now is my role as Yisrael, as the father of the head of the family, how am I going to look? 
So that's why he picks your step. It's, it, it, there's all sorts of explanations. That unfortunately, time doesn't allow it. But uh, but that might be just an explanation. Again, it's his, his role as Yaakov, as Israel, as the bigger picture looking forward. Okay. It's all right. What we don't get to, we can have a cover to in afterwards. So. Okay. Um, okay. So let, we're talking about Yaakov and Yosef. So the end of uh, the end of page one. So he says again, what about that other explanation I mentioned that Rashi cited from the, the Targum, from Unclus, that it was that he was the smart one, right? He was a clever one, and he passed all of his knowledge on to him. So that's the last paragraph in, in sort of page one. But Unclus and the Unclus, the the, the she, Amar Bar Hakim, who translated Ben Kunim as Bar Hakim, a child of of, of his wisdom, Yerselamar, he wants to say. He was knowledgeable and clever and intelligent in his father's eyes. And just like a, an elderly sage, uh, his ta'am, his flavor, and he, he had the aptitude of a, of a sage. And a yelled skunim, a child of old age, is translated bar saktin. The Torah doesn't say he was a ben skunim. He was to him. As a Ben Skunim. Again, subjectivity. Shahaya ken be'enah. He was thus in his eyes, right? Ki Ben Skunim hulo. He is to him. I Meaning it might not be that he was objectively wise. We all think our kids are smart and the best, right? They're all, they're all the top of the class, right? But he saw something subjectively in, in, um, in Yosef. Bazot kavanatam ba'omram. And that is their intention in the Midrash that the Rush he had cited over the page. The Midrash in Breshit Rabba, which says, Kol lamad mishan, marsal, everything that he'd learned according to the Midrash in the Shiva of Shem Ever, he passed down onto Yosef. Lomar, that is to say, says Rabban, Shemasar lo chachamot besitrei Torah, that he passed all the wisdom and secrets of Torah onto him. Um, skill and found him to be intelligent, Ubal sod behem and, 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 and able to contain wisdom and, and, and mysticism uh, among all the brothers. As if he was a sage and elderly and wise uh, of, of years um, as well. So that, that's him trying to sort of explain where Onkelos is coming from. So we have different explanations to Yaakov's love for yourself. Interestingly, no one mentions Rachel, as Susan pointed out. Perhaps that's what the brothers thought of though. But the Torah tells us the reason he loved him, either because he cared for him the most or because he saw him as intelligent or a continuation. Those are the two, and, and Rashi said it was an age thing, although Ramban, Ramban personally did not like that. Okay, so to skip on a little bit in the story, um, we know that the brothers uh, um, resent him and they plan to do bad things to him. And the brothers initially want to kill him until Reuven intervenes. So let's look at the next section, Reuven's intervention. We'll look at the Psukim and then we'll look at Ramban. Bayamu ish elachiv. So that they see he's coming to him, and they, the brothers say one to another, right? This dreamer is coming towards us. The Ata, let's go. The Chuvenaharagehu, let's go kill him. By the way, it's like so depressing that you read it, so trivial in the in the Psukim, because even think about it, right? Even Asaph, who hated Yaakov, said that he would never, he said, Yikravu Yemei Evel Bani, wait till my father dies, and then when I'll cut Kibbut up. He's not going to kill his brother. He hated Yaakov, um, but he didn't. He would never even uh, think about killing his, his child. And that was Rivka's mistake. That's when she sent him away because Asa would never have killed Yaakov in Yitzchak's lifetime. That's even got, and that which we know, that's the little bit of Sheva, a bit of praise we have for Asa with his kibbud Av is totally gone in this story, right? They want to kill him. They don't care about the, the re re repercussions. It's just something that we don't always notice. But the fact that the brothers are willing to kill, to kill Yosef, at least some of them, and that, you know, even Esau wouldn't have done that. Just uh, the important comparison. So let's go kill him. And we'll throw him into, uh, into one of the pits. By the way, I think the assumption here is that they throw his body into one of the pits, right? Because first it says we'll kill him, and then it says we'll throw him in the pit, meaning get rid of the body. The Amarno, what we'll, we'll say, that a wild animal ate him. And then we'll see what comes of his dreams. By Yishma Ruven and Ruven, like the oldest brother, heard by Yatsilehu Miyadam, and he saved him from their hand. By Yomer, and he said, Lo nakenu we're not going to kill anyone. By Yomer, he said to them, Ruven said to them, Al Tishbachuda, do not shed blood. Hashlichu Otel Habar Hazeh, throw him into the pit, Asheba Midbar, 
in the desert. But yeah, that is the Chuba, but don't raise a hand against him. The Torah tells us in order to save him from their hand, to return him alive, obviously, to his father. Um, by the way, here we see this idea of El Aviv. It doesn't, it's not Al it's clearly the idea that the father is on his mind as well in terms of that. What is my father going to say about all of this? So let's see what Ram Ramban has to say about Ruben's uh, intervention here. In Kafbet. Al Tish Bafu Dam says, don't shed blood, right? And, and as we famously understand it, Ruben's trying to delay, right? So he says, you know what, don't kill him and throw his body in the pit, but just throw him in the pit and leave him there to die. And then it will be indirect, right? It won't be uh, it won't be that we've killed him, but rather we've left him to, to the wilderness. Al Tish Bafu Dam says Ramban, Amar lehem, Ruben said to them, um, I am um, would I would I would accept what you said when you when you thought to, to, to kill him and in your wretched way. I also uh, hate him and I want him to be killed by others. But you don't get your own hands dirty. Don't don't um, shed blood from your own hand. God forbid that you should get your own hands dirty. Okay, it's a bit morbid. So it seems, but but don't worry, Ramban comes to save Ruben. Bahagavana and the intention that Ruben beholds there. Ruben's intentions through all of this, Haita was Lahatsilo Lahashivo Alavi. That's what the Torah is telling us. This was just all a ruse in order to save him and bring him back to his father. Siper and the Torah tells us. The Torah only tells us the, argue, the final argument of Reuven to which they listened. Ramban says something fascinating. He said, there were other things that Reuven had said to them initially that they did not accept from him. Says, says, says Ramban, Reuven, this is not like, it sounds morbid, like, oh, just don't get your hands dirty. You don't want to, you know, let someone else do, do the killing so it can't get back to you and you're not the one to be blamed. But Ramban says that's only the last argument of Ruben. But he, clearly he tried to make better efforts before. And how do we know this? Komosha Amar it says to them, and this is in Parashat the Kates, Halo dibarti aleichem, surely I told you, Lemar saying, Al techtu bayeled, don't sin against the child and you didn't listen. Right, when they all get, you know, dragged back to Egypt again and again, with the fact Ruben turns to them and I says, and he says, you know, and Shimon gets put in prison in, in Egypt. Uh, and he says, I told you, this is all your fault for selling yourself. This is our punishment. I told you, don't touch him. Says Ramban, when did you, when did you say don't touch him? You just said, all you said here is, we're not going to get our hands dirty. So it must be that Reuven had already tried to convince them not to touch him at all. So Ramban is, uh, again, extrapolating from later on in the story and coming back and saying, you see, Reuven obviously did try something. The Torah only tells us the last argument of Reuven. But he did try to save him entirely, always. He didn't just go straight to this. That's Ramban's point here. When Reuben saw that they wouldn't listen just to leave Yosef alone entirely, then then he told them, Imken, if this is the case, so don't let it be by your hand. And that was just a delay tactic. He also didn't say, don't shed his blood. He just said, don't shed blood. He doesn't say, his blood. Because he pretended, because that would that would sorry that would show that he's um, he wanted to display because he's not saying this out of love for he wants to pretend that he's not saying this out of love for yourself. Just that they shouldn't be murderers. He's teaching them he's teaching them that simply the punishment of someone who indirectly um, kills somebody is not as severe as the punishment of somebody who directly uh, kills someone, right? Manslaughter rather than murder, right? In our terms. But Ruven never really wanted this. This was an absolute last resort. And, and Ramban tells us, extrapolating from later on in the story, clearly Ruven tried more. Because he turns to them and says, I told you we weren't supposed to touch our brother. So, so it's showing you here that Ruven really did try. And it's not that the intervention was weak. It's just this was the last, the last thing that brothers finally agreed to. But of course, Ruven did try to save them uh, further earlier on. It's an important point for Reuven's character because uh, we know that in, in general, right, Reuven, the, the, the Bukhara, the birthright is, is ultimately sort of, is passed over partially because of the sin 
in last week's parasha about whatever he did with Bilha after Rachel died. Um, but here he tries to, to restore his status as Bukhar, um, doesn't succeed in persuading his brothers. Um, and that sort of, and he's at passed over. Shimon and Levi, we know, are also cursed at the end, the end of Yaakov's life for what they did in killing the town of Shechem over what happened with Dina. Uh, and then that leaves basically with Yehuda, and then we know Yehuda goes through his own journey, and that's what we're going to look at in a moment, um, which is the journey of Yehuda, who basically, uh, after this story, immediately the Torah interrupts the story of, of, of Yosef being sold down to Egypt to tell us about this obscure story about Yehuda and Tamar. Um, just a bit of background, because I haven't quoted whole Perak, um, so I couldn't put the whole thing on the sheet, but basically Yehuda's son uh, marries a, a local woman called Tamar, uh, he dies heir, and then so she does Yibum, Yev, Leveret marriage with Onan, Yehuda's other son, then he also tragically dies, and then he doesn't want to give Tamar to his third son, Sheila, so he fobs her off with excuses, saying, you know, wait till he's too young, wait till he's older, and then, but that never happens, so Tamar dresses up as a harlot and seduces Yehuda directly, because Yehuda being the father of the tribe, or the family, is also able to, to, to in those times, to, to um, to have Yibum, Leveret marriage with her, and then she becomes pregnant from him. Uh, but she doesn't tell anyone it's from him, so he wants to execute her for adultery, because she's still supposed to marry the younger son, and then she hints that it's actually your, your, your child. Um, I'm pregnant from you, and I'm the harlot that you met on the way. And then he says that very important line, which we're going to discuss later, Sad come many. She is correct. And it's that, that, that recognition that we have to take responsibility for our actions, which is part of Yehuda's tshuva here, which is why ultimately Yehuda is, is kind of like Yaakov's Bechor. He becomes the, the king, right? And that's why all the kings come from Yehuda, David, Shlomo, etc. Because Reuven failed, Shimon and Levi are, are punished, and Yehuda takes over. And this story here is part of the transition of Yehuda, because Yehuda is the one who says, let's not put him in a pit. What gain are we going to get? Let's sell him down to Egypt. So therefore, it's very fitting that immediately the Torah interrupts the story to say, but Yehuda turns his life around and starts to accept responsibility. So that's what we're going to see uh, in the time remaining to us, the story of Yehuda and his, his whole story. Yehuda and Tamar. So the, there's, I couldn't quote the whole thing, so I just gave a brief synopsis outside, but um, the passage I did bring here in, in the section Yehuda and Tamar on page two, and it was after three months of the incident where Tamar lies with Yehuda. Uh, she's three months pregnant. By your godly who done it's told you who the lame are saying Zanta Tamar Kalatech, your daughter in law Tamar has committed adultery because she's pregnant and we don't know how she's pregnant or from whom. For Gam Hine Haral is Nunim and she's become pregnant due to this uh, illicit relationship. But Yomer Yehud and Yehuda says, not knowing that it's from him she's pregnant, Hotsi Uha Vachisarev, take her out that she should be burned at the stake. Right? So um, trying to understand the, the, the times. Um, so first let's have a look at uh, Ramban citing Rashi. Ramban says, Amar, if, um, Amar Ephraim Miksha, Tamidosh Rabbi Meir, Bishim Rabbi Meir. So it's brought in the name Rabbi Meir. Why is it that she's, she's, she's punished in this way? So, Tamar Bitel Shel Shem, so the Midrash that Rashi is citing, says that Tamar was the daughter of Shem. Shehu Kohen. Shem was considered like a Kohen, like a priest in some respect. The Fikach Danua Bisrefa. And as a result, uh, her punishment was severe. That she was banned at the state because that was the norm at the time for, for, for priests because she basically ruined the reputation of the house. Zekat of Rashi Velo Kershaw. That Rashi cites that Midrash, says Ramban, but he doesn't explain it. Says Ramban in the next paragraph, I didn't know this, this halacha. That a bat kohen, the daughter of a kohen, that she has to be burnt at the stake to, for adultery. Um, on the that, that might only be the case about a married woman, but not a woman who's waiting to do Yibo, waiting to leverage marriage. Again, it's very important to understand the context of the time. Sanhedrin, a, a, a daughter of a Kohen, who's even if Shem was a Kohen and Shem was her father. Again, that's not in the Pshat. But if, if that's the case, if she was waiting to do Yibo, Shazinta, and she committed adultery, there's no punishment for a woman who, I mean, it's, it's forbidden, but it's no punishment, there's no adultery. Of a person who's waking to Yibam and, and has a relationship with someone else. There's no, there's no capital punishment. It's a love, it's a prohibition, but it doesn't generate the death penalty. So why is it that Tamar was punished so severely? And don't forget, we're also talking about before the Torah was given. 
Vim Tamaran, if you're going to say, Shahaya Hayibun no Hayibun Noach, and if you're going to say that already with B'nai Noach, meaning it was universal practice already before the Torah was given, that this is what you do, um, that Yibum existed, leveret marriage existed before, and therefore she is if she's a married woman, and therefore she um, merits the death penalty. But surely Chazal say that Yehuda was the first one, according to Chazal, who, who, who basically introduced the idea of Yibum. The idea being to protect the wife who's, who's, whose husband has died and she has no children. It was a societal tikkun, it was a correction to help the woman, otherwise she, she would be a widow with no, no fortune, no children to look after. It was, and, and Yehuda's the one who, who began it and initiated it. So, so why is it that he decided to also punish her so severely? The Gemara also tells us that there's no actual punishment for a person who doesn't do Yibam, even though it's a biblical requirement. So she was Jewish, I always understood she wasn't Jewish. What does it mean Jewish? The Hanim Min Matan Torah, yes. So right, seemingly she's a local, she's a local yeah. woman. Yeah. Chazal clearly took the idea up, she got such capital punishment, but she must have been like a bat for hen, and that's clearly why they, they say that she was the daughter of Shem, because it's this idea that Shem was a Kohen El Elyon, um, or is it, Chazal identifies Shem as Malkut Tzedek from, from Pasha Lech Lecha, but, but clearly that, that's what bothered them to say that she must have had some yifts, right? Yeah. Otherwise, why would she be treated so yeah. harshly? But either way, Ramban says, I don't understand it. And he says, Venir Eli, and it seems to me, the last, the last paragraph on page two, Shahaya Yehuda Katsin Shoter Moshe Baretz, that it wasn't because of her status, but because of Yehuda's uh, status. And it seems to me that Yehuda was the, the, the officer, the ruler, uh, the premier, if you like, of the land. The Hakala and the daughter-in-law, Tamar, who was married to his, to his sons, Ashet Yizne'alav, who, who basically cheated on him and his family, she was not sentenced to the same sentence as other people because it wasn't that she, it wasn't because of her status that she's treated more severely, but because of the family that she married into. As if she, she disgraced the monarchy, right? It's the equivalent of somebody who marries into the royal family who, who does a crime, they get the book thrown at them in theory. Okay. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't see just a couple of things. Um, yeah. Where the leveret marriage comes in, I don't, I don't, I never knew about that. And secondly, of course, it's, it's the woman who gets burnt at the stake. And what about the man who made her pregnant, of course? So the thing, I mean, I, I mean, the, the rule, I mean, we're going, we're going into very uh, sensitive uh, area, but to give a brief synopsis is that somebody who commits adultery, that the, the husband is also uh, obligated, uh, is also high of meter, also biblically warrants the death penalty. Here he's okay. not known. They didn't know who it was. It turns out that it was somebody she was allowed to marry, the father of the tribe, right? And therefore, it turned out okay. But uh, if, if they'd known who he was, he would have also got the death penalty. But he took her word for it. Right. He took her word for it. And she proved it because she, she, she takes the staff. His redemption is that he, he could have kept silent, but he says yes. So um, so so you, you're right. Who was that who asked the question, Hannah? No, and I just didn't know about the lever. The lever so that, that, that's the, that's the, uh, the mechanism that this is all based upon here, basically. The understanding that was her harsh treatment, but because why is she it had been punished? because she had a leveret marriage, right? Why? And therefore she right because she had a leveret marriage, and therefore she was in some sense supposed to marry uh, into the rest of the family. Again, the idea of, of when you read the pesukim in Devar, oh, it's clear see, at least yes. for the Torah sense, it. it's meant to protect. Them. Right, that's why that's why Chazal obviously you know already two thousand years ago <laughs> took the focus away from Yibam and we don't do Yibam anymore. We do Chalitza instead, and they made Chalitza much. Um, more um, viable and, and attractive option because because times have changed. <laughs> but, the, okay. but the point is that in a time where you're left with nothing, yeah, it's a kindness okay. and it has to be agreed to. But what Chazal did, and this is sheer for another time, but what Chazal did is they they said, okay, but Yibum, um, that might have been you know the, the optimal option once, but not anymore. And, and, we, and at least that Ashkenazim for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we don't do Yibum. Because um, mm -hmm. times have changed, and it's that's that's what Chazal come and do, and Chazal do all sorts of things, and they try and and, and to, to attract people away from Yibum. But we're talking, you know, over three thousand years ago, where if this woman is left with no dowry, no children to look after her, <laughs> she's already a, a widow, so she's already been married, so so she's 
the sunsets, unfortunately, on the shelf in, in the way that they would look at it in those times. And therefore, she has this option if she wants to remain in a family who can look after. Okay. Thank you. Khalitsa, we still do, but we, we, we push for Khalitsa over Yibam now because we don't do Yibam anymore. But, um, but, but what's the idea here? Why is the Yibam come so harshly towards her? Because it was a disgrace to his family. But al Kain Katuv, and therefore it says, Vayama Yehuda Hotsiyam Tisrev Yehuda says, Take her out to be burned. Kibaul Fanav Lasot Bakukhala Shayitza there, because they came to do according to what he wished. He said that she deserves the death penalty because she has been Moreba Malchut. She has uh, rebelled against the authority, Yehuda being the prince of the realm. It's not that this is the regular din, the din of Hediotot of common folk. This was a special halakha that Yehuda instigated because she had, due to the family that she'd married into. What's so ironic about it? Right, right. He didn't want to marry, he wanted to out the way. And not only that, that comes to our final section, the last few minutes that we have, which is, it was all Yehuda's uh, doing anyway. He's the father of the child. And this is the uh, turning point for Yehuda. Right. Right, he does have some sort of rulership, but what, what, is, what is the key of the story, Lamad Chet? that if you're a ruler, you also have to take responsibility and no one is above the law. And he tries to throw the book at her and it's even more understandable according to Rabban. That's why he wanted to sentence her to death because, you know, it's a disgrace to the royal family or to the, you know, the premier's family, yeah. you know, higher standards, right? So um, we expect from our rulers to have higher standards. So, and ironically, it's that he didn't have higher standards and that he went off with a harlot, what he thought was a harlot. That's why she's pregnant. It's actually yeah. his doing. And this is the turning point for Yehuda. He tried to throw the book at her, and now he has to say, wait a minute, no, we're not throwing the book at her, it's my fault. And that's these, these, these beautiful, beautiful psukim here in Lamad Chet, top of page three. He mut said, and, but this is ultimately why he merits yeah. the kuhuna. But, and not the kuhuna, the malchut, sorry. This is why he merits the rulership, because he knows to be a ruler, you have to take responsibility. He mut said, so the psukim, like, she was being taken out to be sentenced to death. But she'd sent to her father-in-law, Lamar, meaning to Yehuda, saying, and she'd had his stick and everything that he gave to her as a guarantee, a payment for, for lying with her. The man who these belong to, and he obviously recognized them as his own objects, and I'm pregnant from him. But Tomer, and she says, recognize, to who is this, this uh, signet ring and, uh, and the staff? And, uh, and, and basically the rap and everything, the, the, these personal signs. Vayaker Yehuda, and Yehuda recognizes them. That word is so loaded, and I'll just scroll down in a second. Vayomer Yehuda, and he said, Sadka Mimeni, she is right from me, or more correct than I am. Al Kiki, Al Ker, learn of Tila Shelavuni, because I didn't give her to my other son, Shayla, to do Yibun. Okay, so he takes he takes responsibility. But look at that word. She says to him, Haker, recognize. And then he finally makes that responsibility by Yaker. And he recognizes. Where's that word familiar from? Let's go down just to the end of the page. I quoted a few times. This isn't strictly Ramban, but I have to bring it because I just can't help myself. Velohi Kiro. Who, where's this pasuk from? Velohi Kiro, at the, the end, the three pasuk I brought at the end. Velohi Kiro, he did not recognize him. Because his hands were like Aesop's, they were covered in hair. Who was the first person who didn't recognize? Yitzchak did not recognize Yaakov because Yaakov deceived um, Yitzchak. In turn, what happens in the next Pasuk? Yaakov, in turn, is deceived. In the next Pasuk I brought from the beginning of this week's parasha, they sent to somebody the, the coat, the colored coat, and they brought it to their father, and they say, we found this coat, recognize, do you recognize it? So Yitzchak is deceived by Yaakov, Yaakov in turn, the same word, is, is deceived by his own sons, and we know Yehuda is, part, is the leader of this plan, and then what happens? Yehuda now is deceived in turn with Tamar. So that word is very loaded. If you go back to the top of page three again, when she says to him in Pasuk Kafhe, Hakerna, recognize, she's telling him, recognize that these are your objects and I'm pregnant from you, but the word Haker, recognize 
responsibility. You have to take responsibility for your actions. And what happens, and we ha finally have that tshuva in Pasuk Kavav, Vayaker Yehuda. Yehuda recognizes. Yehuda makes that step. And he says, Sad kamim in. She, she's, she's correct, uh, and I'm in the wrong. Uh, by the way, that word will repeat itself again uh, next week's parasha, which I brought the final Pasuk on the page. When the brothers then go down to Egypt, Vayaker Yosef et Echav. Yosef recognizes them, but he looks different. He's Egyptian now, with, you know. Vehem lo hikiruhu. They didn't recognize him. So the Torah gets here first and says, well, Yehuda has already gone through a Teshuvah process. The other brothers haven't quite yet, but Yehuda has gone through the process. And that's very important. I'll just end off with a, that last phrase I mentioned, Sad Kamimeni, where Yehuda makes his recognition. Rashi understands this is the Ramban here on, on the page. Uh, Sad Kamimeni, so first it says Sadka. Rashi understands it means she was right, and Mimeni it means Himu Uberet says Rashi she's pregnant from me. So Rashi understands it to be Sadka she's right, Mimeni it's my child from me. She's right, it's Mimeni it's from me. But Rashi um, Rashi uh, that's how Rashi understands. But Ramban in the next paragraph understands differently. Vahanachon the paragraph being Vahanachon Shahu Kamot Sadikim Vatovim Mimeni it means not from me but than me. That those who are righteous and better from us is quoting Pasuk Malachim Aleph. Um, David Sadik Tamimeni, you are more righteous than me. Tani Hatova, our second line there. Sadka Bama Yotermimeni. She is more right than me. It's not Sadka, she's right. She's in, she's she's innocent, Mimeni. It's from me, the child's from me. No, Sadka Mimeni. She is more correct than I am. She is in the right, I'm in the wrong. It's that recognition that Ramban. Gives uh, Yehuda credit for here. Ki he had sadeket. She's the innocent one. The ania chote eleha, and I'm the one who sinned to her. Shelona tatiha le sheila bani, because I did not give her to sheila, my son, to marry. So that's why she had to do this trickery to get to get back into the family. Um, What's the reference in the Rambam? The the pasuk said sadikim v'tovim mimeni. It's just showing you that you, there's this concept of sadik mimeni that someone can be more righteous than me. Meaning you're in the. She, he he turns around and says. You're in the right. I'm in the wrong. She's she's right. I'm the one who made the mistake here. And that is again why Yehuda goes through this bayaker, that word, that, that loaded word, the whole way through the book of Horatia that we've seen and will continue to be in Horatia. And this is why the Torah interrupts the story here to tell you early on that Yehuda learned from his mistake and makes the makes that shuva process. And that that mark of a good leader is somebody who can say, Sadka, she's right, and Sadka many, she's more right than I am. And Vayaker, he recognizes it. That's a very important uh, message. Uh, for us all, um, especially in this story. Uh, wonderful learning with you all again, as always. It's lovely to see more and more people in person. I hope more and more people feel free to, to come in person as well. So um, have a wonderful uh, day and rest of the week. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Shkaya. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.